Welcome to this week's edition of the Baylor Report. I'm Jane Baylor. Our guest this week is the candidate for the first congressional district, the Republican Jim Hagedorn. Welcome. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Jane. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. We uh, would like to have you do your background for our viewers, a little bit about what you did before you decided that you wanted to serve in the United States Congress. Sure, that's fine. I'm Jim Hagedorn. I grew up on a grain and livestock farm over by Truman. I was born in the city of Blue Earth, so I'm a South Central Minnesotan. And uh, at some point, uh, I had a, a job as working for, with Congressman Stanglin of Northwest Minnesota. So I have experience out in Washington, also have experience as a treasury executive and my claim to fame is downsizing my own federal agency probably something that's never happened before with a congressional candidate i also have small business experience here in southern minnesota southeastern minnesota and for the last three years the last two elections i've been running full-time seeking your vote so it's a it's just a pleasure again to be here thank you okay why do you want to go to congress well let me tell you i think our country's in trouble and if we don't make big bold change in the in the short uh, coming future, we're going to lose our country the way the forefathers put it together. And so I, I believe that we need to protect our country, secure our borders, protect our country from extremists that want to do us harm. Our economy is, st is struggling, it's stagnant. We need to get our economy back growing strong so we have good paying jobs for our people, have excellent economic growth. Our farmers are, are not doing so well at this point either. And then I want to protect our God-given rights. And for me, that means the Second Amendment, the right to life, and the the right to religious freedom. Those are the, the main issues in the campaign, and that's why I want to go to Congress. You know, uh, most recently when they did the last poll, the disapproval rating for the, the United States Congress was over 55%. Why do you think that is? Well, part of that, I suppose, is because my opponent's been in Washington for 10 years, and maybe it's time for a change. But in all honesty, the institution of the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate is a little disjointed. The presidency is a more focused uh, uh, job. But I think what's, what people are sensing out here in southern Minnesota and across the country is that our government isn't doing its job, not protecting us. The economy is bogged down with too much government. Uh, you know, the people in Washington just aren't responsive to the people. And so uh, one of the main things that I'd like to see done is that we take power from Washington take power from the Washington politicians, the bureaucrats, the interest groups, and send it back to the states and the people. And I would try to accomplish that in the areas of education, transportation, taxation, and then when we get into veterans uh, issues, I'd like to do that too. I think our veterans deserve more power rather than the VA. How do you uh, expect to start this? What would be your first initiative if elected? Uh, when you take office in January, what would you do first? Well, the first thing you have to do in an institution like the House of Representatives is work uh, with like-minded people to move the bills through the Congress. This is a presidential year. We're going to have a new leader in Washington for our country. I believe that leader should be Donald Trump. And if it is, then he's going to have very strong initiatives into securing the borders, into making sure that our country is protected from extremists that hate America, making sure that we reform government in the areas of regulatory reform, tax reform energy independence. And so I would get behind our new president and make sure that we were working along those lines to pass those big ideas through so we can get the, uh, get the country moving in the right direction again. What can you do from Congress? <laughs> you find your coalitions, your like-minded sure. people, and then, uh, then what do you do? Well, you bring ideas to the table. I mean, when I worked uh, as a Treasury executive many years ago, one of the things that I did is uh, I recognized that my agency could be more efficient. So as, a, as an employee, as a congressional relations officer, I took a piece of legislation and moved it through the Congress that saved our country about a billion and a half dollars. And it closed four check writing centers. It forced the government to be more efficient. We need people in Washington, elected leaders, who are going to take that initiative and try to try to have uh, government reform along those lines. And that's just something, one idea that I, I've had in the past. And so that's the, that's the mentality that I would take to Washington. You have to do what you can to protect the people and the taxpayers. Since you started with Treasury and dollars, we have a couple of crises in the area of our dollars. Uh, but right now, the biggest problem is our national debt. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do we do about that? 
Well, we do have, uh, several things when it comes to the national debt. One is uh, we quit making the problem worse. Unfortunately, my opponent, when he went to Washington 10 years ago, the debt stood at about $8.5 trillion. Now it's almost $20 trillion. We've spent all that extra money. We've had the Federal Reserve put a bond buying program out there that put a lot of money in the economy. We've had interest rates near zero, and yet our economy is struggling with 1% growth, 94 million people out of work. People haven't had, a, haven't had a wage increase in 10 or 15 years. Nobody has disposable income. When it comes to the debt itself, this is a big problem because the debt at 20 trillion is larger than the U.S. economy and it's growing faster than the U.S. economy. So we're going to have to reform entitlements. We're going to have to reform our government. But most importantly, we have to get the economy rolling again. We have to expand the pie, make it bigger. And if we do that, then we have a chance to attack the debt, address it, and start paying it down. How do you restart the economy? The economy right now, I believe, is bogged down with way too much government in Washington, D.C. Regulations are strangling our small business owners, our farmers, our manufacturers. You can go any bankers. Go anywhere and talk with folks who are in business, and they'll tell you, government, federal government regulations, especially out of the Obama administration, EPA, FDA, USDA, really hurting the economy. One of the first things that I would advocate is that the Congress approve all major regulations. The House and Senate would have to approve before the regulations would hit our economy. That bill is called the RAINS Act. My opponent, Congressman Walls, has voted against that repeatedly. I support that. I also think we need tax reform, tax simplification. We should have a system where that the people of our country can file their taxes easily, uh, don't have to spend a lot of money doing it, and then they're in charge of how their money is spent. You're in charge, whether you want to spend it, save it, invest it, uh, those types of things, rather than be coerced by the special interests in the IRS and the politicians. And then lastly, I think to really get the economy rolling, we need energy independence. And that means an all of the above approach here in the United States to make sure that we have, we don't import any more crude oil and that we can put downward pressure on the price of fuel and energy, transportation, food. And to do that, we're going to have to build the pipelines, the refineries, the distribution points, that energy infrastructure in order to make that efficient. And if we do that, we can grow our economy, we can create high wage jobs, we can get back our manufacturing and uh, ultimately, we can uh, have a better country. Okay, the uh, Federal Reserve has kept the interest rate very low, and they even talk about negative interest rates. In other words, you'd pay the bank to take care of your money. What can you do about that? Well, the Congress has a role here. I mean, they gave the Federal Reserve its power back in the early part of the previous century. And the question would be, should the Congress take back some of that power? I would, I would look at that and I would revisit it. Uh, they always talk about auditing the Fed. I mean, it doesn't really matter at this point whether they're audited or not. We know they're not doing their job properly. And when you look in the last, especially eight, 10 years, we've had very cheap money in this, in this uh, economy. They've flooded the country with a lot of stimulus and yet the economy isn't growing. So where do we go from here? Like you say, do we have negative interest rates? It's, it's a big problem. Uh, the U.S. economy is in trouble, our agriculture economy is in trouble, and that's not good for southern Minnesota or southern Minnesotans, and, uh, and, uh, I, but I would, I would be open to changes in that area. Okay, let's talk about globalism versus nationalism. Mm -hmm. And this seems to be the uh, debate in our national elections, of which this is one. Where do you come in? I come in, I'm an America first person. I believe that the most important thing that we can do uh, moving forward is to secure our borders and have a regular uh, order when it comes to immigration. We should have legal immigration. We should also have a work program for people who uh, need to come to our country to fill jobs uh, for our businesses and farmers and others. But uh, I'm, I'm very big supporter of securing America's borders and protecting our country from people that don't like us. When it comes to uh, the refugee programs and things of that nature. Uh, I'm a realist. This is what I believe. I believe that our country is at war with Islamic supremacists who adhere to an ideology of radical Islam. And I believe that our country, our government, has let us down since 9-11. haven't secured our borders and we've brought in far too many people not properly vetted. So I've called for a refugee program timeout. 
in order to make sure that we're going to protect our country, protect our communities like Rochester and other communities even here in so southern Minnesota, and that uh, certainly we should not be bringing in the Guantanamo Bay terrorists the way my opponent has suggested and housing them here in Rochester's Federal Medical Center. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The Islamic terrorists should be given the last rights, not Miranda rights. And when it comes to trade, I, I support Donald Trump's effort to uh, revisit the trade deals, to not necessarily re renegotiate them all, but to review them. And trade and exports are very important to southern Minnesota, especially our farmers. I would support the trade deals that Mr. Trump and his administration said are in our best interest, and I look forward to voting for those deals in the future. Uh, you sound like the only role that would be there would be if Mr. Trump is elected. <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm just an optimist. I happen to be a Republican, and I think that would be best for the country for a number of reasons. Uh, I, I think if Hillary Clinton is elected president, we're going to lose the Supreme Court for generations, and that would be devastating to the people as far as our basic rights, Second Amendment, and so forth. But uh, no, I'm, a, I'm an independent leader as well. I'm not going to take my cue from Mr. Trump. As a matter of fact, he's running on issues that I've been advocating for many years, even before him. Uh, the Congress needs people. Southern Minnesota needs a representative who will look out for our interests. Uh, one of the interests that I think that needs to be uh, promoted in Congress on behalf of Southern Minnesota and the nation is replacing Obamacare. I look at Obamacare as the biggest threat to progress for Rochester and Olmstead County. Uh, I don't believe a top-down Washington, D.C.-based approach with 20 to 50,000 pages of regulations, the loss of insurance, the loss of the doctor-patient relationship, the move from private insurance to government insurance, which under-reimburses institutions like Mayo and our rural hospitals, that's a, that is a recipe for disaster down the road, and I think we need to replace Obamacare with free market reforms. I've laid them out on my website. And uh, things like competition across state lines, expanded use of health savings accounts to promote shopping, pools for people with pre-existing conditions. If we do that, we can get our health care system back and people won't have to pay these outrageous premiums and be canceled by, unfortunately, Blue Cross Blue Shield as they were earlier this year. The, uh health insurance situation is creating great problems for Obamacare as well, just as it sits. And uh, what can be done about that? Well, as I said, I think the, the free market reforms that we've discussed will make a lot of sense because we can expand competition across the United States. That's going to put downward pressure on the cost of premiums and deductibles. And I talked to a farmer just last night at an event over in Sleepy Eye. And they told me that they're paying premiums of $25,000 a year with a deductible of $12,500 each year. The deductible is so high that the underlying insurance is worthless because they never really meet their deductible unless they have a, a terrible uh, medical issue. And so those types of things, I, I talked to a person in Winona recently who quit a $27 an hour job because the Obamacare premiums that they were paying each week of $400, it made more sense to quit work go on unemployment or go on welfare and get minsure or get uh, subsidized care. So these types of things, it's not good when, when people across the country are losing their savings and disposable income or people are quitting jobs or starting jobs simply because of insurance. This Obamacare was, uh, is a disaster. Our Congressman Walls, he promised when they passed Obamacare seven years ago, he said, you get to keep your doctor, you get to keep your plan, you're going to save $2,500 a year. And by the way, he said he'd live under it just like you. All absolute total lies. Well, Congress doesn't live under most of the laws that pass, right? That's a problem. The Congress of the United States should live under the laws that they impose on the people or enact for the people. And uh, that, that in the 1990s, uh, when Newt Gingrich became the Speaker of the House, one of the best things the Republicans passed is that uh, a law that forced the Congress to live under the same rules as everyone else, and we need to get back to that. Uh, my opponent said he would, he would live under Obamacare like you, but he gets a huge subsidy from the federal taxpayers, maybe upwards of almost $20,000 a year, and uh, mo that doesn't sound like he's living under Obamacare just like you. That sounds like there's a special deal for Tim Walls and then another deal for the rest of us. That sounds an awful lot like Hillary Clinton, actually. All right, so the uh, farmers of Minnesota and southeast Minnesota, southwest Minnesota, 
what's the greatest issue at the federal level that's affecting the farmers? Farmers are in a tough spot. The ag economy is tightened. Commodity prices are low. The high, the input costs are still high. We're, you know, lower on our exports. The farm economy is is in trouble, and our farmers are hurting. The biggest issue that I hear from farmers and agribusiness owners across southern Minnesota is, is federal regulations. The federal regulations coming out of President Obama's administration, particularly the EPA, are driving up farmers' costs, harassing harassing farmers, making it more difficult for them to be profitable. And uh, we need that regulatory reform. Other things, though, high energy prices are not good for agriculture. That's why we need energy independence. And then there are things like the death tax. Why in the world are we going to try and force our southern Minnesota farm families to sell out, small business families to sell out, rather than hold the land and continue operations from generation to generation? I'm against the death tax. My opponent voted for it. And lastly, one of the biggest obstacles to farming right now and cutting into the bottom line is Obamacare. It's, it's really hurting the people, it's hurting families. I believe it needs to be replaced. You know, uh, they introduced the first robotic tractor this, yeah. uh, in the last couple of weeks. What will happen to our small farmers? Because they won't be able to afford robotic tractors, but there also wouldn't be jobs there. I don't know that Congress has a role in that. Congress may not have a direct role in that, but here's my position. I mean, I grew up on a grain and livestock farm near Truman. My father, grandfather, great-grandfather, all southern Minnesota farmers. Family farming is very important to southern Minnesota and especially our rural communities. And I would add that our rural communities are very important to Rochester and the Olmstead County area. And so uh, I think that we should make sure that our federal government doesn't have policies that are going to make it too onerous, too difficult for family farmers to continue. I just talked about the death tax and regulations and some of these things. We need to make sure that government is not artificially pushing our family far farmers out of business. And so uh, that's the role of government that I see, to make sure that uh, we support and defend agriculture. Let's face it, uh, agriculture is a national security issue. Where would we be in America if we had to import our food like we import some of our oil? We certainly would be relying on countries that uh, are probably not our friends. The prices would be higher and the quality would be less. So I'm a, a very strong advocate for America's family farmers and our agricultural system. What can be done with respect to the oil pipeline that has been stopped and now a subsequent pipeline in North Dakota that's been opposed by the Native American communities has also been put on hold for the time being by the Department of mm -hmm. Justice. And uh, then today we read for Saudi Arabia is now again number one in oil. Um, how does the United States regain the superiority it had in terms of production of oil? Well, part of this is a little bit, you know, it's, it's a commodity, so it's up and down, and the production moves up and down. But I'm a big believer in knocking down the barriers, whatever it takes, in order to build that infrastructure for energy, the pipelines, refineries, and distribution points, so we can efficiently use our crude oil, natural gas, and other resources. I'm an all-of-the-above person. I believe that we should use not just the natural resources that God gave us, but also renewables, geothermal, conservation. It's all important. Uh, but when it comes to uh, energy independence, there's only one path to become energy independent in the United States, and that is the, the drilling and production of more crude oil. And crude oil is the only uh, ener energy resource that the United States is forced to import. And so for us to get there, we're going to have to open up drilling on federal lands, in parts of Alaska, in some places along the coast. We're going to have to expand the opportunity for American companies and American uh, entrepreneurs to get out there and get the oil that's in the ground for us. Okay, immigration is a big issue nationally and uh, the costs of the immigration as well as the social problems that come with it. Uh, how would you reform immigration? You said you would make it legal, make legal immigration, but that does not make legal, the Ill Ill illegal yes. immigration. Well, yeah, what I, what I said was that I was a proponent of legal immigration. So 
I believe Ill illegal immigration is, is not in the best interest of the United States. First thing we need to do is build a secure barrier on our U.S.-Mexico border to make sure that people can come here only through a legal process. We keep out uh, people who want to do us harm, like drug dealers and terrorists and others, and that the people that come to the United States come in an orderly process. I would have a work program so folks could come from other countries and work on our farms or do the jobs that are needed for our economy. And maybe they could build up credits and so forth towards citizenship, but I would leave that up to them. They just need to be here in, an, in a legal process. Fifteen years after 9-11, look, look at the record. Our government has learned little to nothing in this area. We have a visa and passport system that still is not secure. It's not biometrically based. We don't know when people come to the country whether they leave or not. Last year, it's an estimated that 500,000 people overstayed temporary visas to the United States. Some people estimate that total number is over 5 million. Many of the people who overstayed their visas to the United States are from countries that don't particularly like America, like Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and others. We should make sure that those people who have overstayed those visas are sent out of our country. Many of the 9-11 hijackers had overstayed their visas or were out of compliance, and perhaps if we had had a system in place then, we wouldn't have had that tragedy. But those are the types of things that I would be a proponent for, that I would fight for in Congress, and frankly, the, the, the party, both parties in Washington have failed in that area. My opponent, though, is an open borders liberal, and he's voted for Obama's amnesty. He and I are on complete opposite sides on that issue. Let's do the, the uh, debt again. Mm -hmm. You'll either have to raise taxes or make cuts in spending. At the same time, Republicans and Democrats say we have to give more money, say, to the military services to be able to protect our country. Where do you go from there? Well, I'm a, I'm a believer that you can reform government and, for instance, the Pentagon. I'm not sure that the overall answer there, even though we do need to modernize our defenses and get back to a point where, uh, where they're not depleted anymore, I think What's going on in the military under President Obama is a, is a disaster, and it's a, it's a brewing disaster for our country. But I think you could go in and reform the Pentagon and save as much as 10 percent of the money and apply that towards the pay and benefits for our troops, apply it towards the weapon systems, and we could have a better, better uh, Department of Defense. So we could do that across, across the board. I mean, there are going to be tough decisions, but the bottom line is if we do not expand the U.S. economy, if we do not get to a point where we have the creation of high wage jobs, where we don't have our capital at play so businesses can get started, move, expand. You know, if we don't do that, we're not going to be able to attack the debt. There won't be enough cuts and there won't be enough revenue increases in order to make it happen. So I'm a, I'm a big believer in making sure that we reform our government and weed out excessive government in the economy so we have the opportunity for it to grow and prosper. Within the last six months to a year, the Agriculture Department, the Interior Department, a number of the departments have been making substantial weapons purchases mm -hmm. and uh, things like bulletproof vests. And people are saying, why does the Department of Agriculture need that kind of military presence? Do you have any answers for that? Well, especially since 9-11, we've seen the federal government expand its uh, law enforcement uh, profile, I guess you would say, and more agencies, you talk about USDA, but also education and some others have uh, uh, put their own police force together and, and so forth. I, I'm, I'm kind of a believer that if the federal government, if the agents and others out there need protection or in special, special cases, uh, buildings need protection, we should have perhaps one Federal, uh, federal agency to handle that. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It'd be something I would look into. I'm not real comfortable with it. And I think overall, we need to make sure that the power of the federal government is diminished. Our federal government is getting to the point where people are afraid of their government on a day-to-day -day basis for one reason or another, whether it's you know an IRS audit or whether it's a business that's afraid of uh, EPA, uh, uh, you know, somebody coming down to crack on their business or whatever. And, and, I, and we get to that point, we have tyranny. So the federal government's too big and powerful. We have to take that power from there and send it back to the states and the people. That's what I'd be for. The uh, president has proposed turning over the responsibility 
the security of the internet mm -hmm. to an international organization, maybe something from the UN, but something that's international. It has been supported by Google and or Facebook mm -hmm. and uh, what's it, the one? Google, Fa Twitter. Twitter, okay. And uh, Congress gets to vote on either allowing that or keeping the authority for managing the internet in the uh, United States. Mm -hmm. Where are you? Yeah, that's, that's a pretty easy one. I would say that if it isn't broke, don't fix it. I would rather see people in the United States uh, managing the internet, managing those things, rather than turning it over to the United Nations, uh, unelected people that we can't control in the United States, perhaps people from China, Russia, and uh, other nations where uh, you know, they may not have the same interests as, as we do. So I would, I would vote against that legislation of President Obama's. Okay, but that will probably be decided by the 1st of October, so you're uh, off the hook until uh, you find out you have to change it or something. I'm not afraid to tell you my position. No, I know. <laughs> All right, we have four minutes left, and I'd like you to review for our viewers what your highest priority would be and how you'd accomplish it. Okay, it's a pleasure to be here. I am Jim Hagedorn candidate for Congress in Minnesota's 1st District. And uh, two years ago, I was on the ballot in 2014. We held the incumbent to a 54-46 position. And over those two years, we've been crisscrossing 21 counties here in Southern Minnesota, attending 43 parades, 20 county fairs, and we're trying to get to every point in the district. And uh, we're out there letting people know what's at stake in this election. I believe the United States of America, that these are critical times, and if we don't win this election of the Republican Party and make big, bold change in Washington, D.C., we're going to lose our country. First and foremost, I believe we need to protect the United States of America. The first responsibility of any member of Congress is to defend America and protect the American people. I would do that by securing America's borders, and I would also do that by protecting our country, uh, you know, more, pe more people coming into the United States from countries that don't like the United States. I think uh, Minnesota, unfortunately, right now has a terrorist recruiting problem from the existing refugee program. We need to take a look at that. We need to figure that out. Secondly, our economy is bogged down with too much government, and we need to let it grow. We need to let it thrive, and we can do that with reforms of the federal government, regulatory reform, tax reform, welfare reform, energy independence. If we make those changes, we can have a growing economy and high-wage jobs for the American people. And lastly, this election is very important about defending our God-given rights. I'm a strong proponent of the Second Amendment, your right to keep and bear arms. I'm a strong proponent of protecting innocent life, whether that's uh, unborn babies or the disabled, the elderly, those with special needs. And lastly, our religious freedoms. I would fight for you every day in Congress to make sure that those things are protected and we change our country for the better. We don't need to transform America. We need to transform our federal government. And I would be someone who would be responsive to you every day on the job. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Jim Hagedorn, for being with us. And uh, we'll look forward to hearing more from you Thank at you. another time. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you, our viewers, for being with us this week. We'll be with you again next week, same time, same place. And have a good week and have a very good night.